Hi, I'm Linda Van Hart, the Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. Welcome to our gallery talk featuring our sculptors. This is all about three-dimensional art. And we have the gamut tonight. Um, we're leading off with my former sculpture professor from Towson University, Jim Paulson. He's been teaching with us quite a few years. Every year he teaches something different. Uh, this year, because of the digital format, it was very lucky that he chose found object sculpture, which is a way to really make the three-dimensional process accessible to just about anyone. It's especially handy for teachers who are working with their students on a limited budget. Uh, without further ado, Jim Paulson, I believe he's president of the Baltimore Sculptures Society. Jim. Right. I uh, um, Actually, my wife, Lee Maddox, is the uh, president of the current president of, of uh, Baltimore Sculptors. Anyway, um, let me go to my uh, my work, which uh, I'm going to show from my laptop here. Um, so um, I, I guess the first thing I, I should say is that uh, usually when I work, um, I tend to work in a series. I'll develop a certain idea or concept and they try to push and pull that and do maybe a series. Series tend to go from five to 25, even more. Um, and um, the first, um, the first uh, grouping I'm going to show is um, some works that um, I, I've chosen. The, 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 the first few works I've chosen to show are works in assemblage, since that's the course I'm teaching. I'm teaching a, an assemblage found object course with uh, common ground. And so um, the first few pieces that I'm going to talk about deal with the found objects. This is a piece that and I don't normally uh, do social political work, but I have two or three of these that um, I'm sort of in sync with the Parkland kids on this whole gun issue. And you'll notice this is a piece that's um, about feet wide and it's uh, completely, it's a map, obviously, of the United States. It's painted black, and it's covered with Saturday night specials. And the whole idea, of course, is that, uh, you know, America has this weird love affair with, with guns. Uh, much, much, to, uh, um, much to our dismay. Now, I think I, I, am I going to have to go out of that? I guess I'm going to have to go out of that and go to each one separately. <clears throat> this is another one. This is a um, another sort of tragic piece where the, you know, the Lady Liberty is uh, sobbing. We have the the bald eagle uh, holding a flaccid gun uh, in, in the mouth of the bird. Uh, another. Another gun piece. Um, I can move move the screen. This is a pillow. It's a soft, uh, cuddly pillow, but in the center of it is a Saturday Night Special. Uh, frequently, the title of a, of a work is not that important to me, but in this case. The title is Send the Pillow That You Dream On. It's an old song from the country and western singer from the 70s, Johnny Tillotson. A thought appropriate for uh, people who um, have this incredible love affair with guns. And then I'm going to show uh, a few other pieces that relate to um, this, this is a work that, um, for those of you who have been coming to Common Ground, you've seen these similar works. This is from my Sentinel series. I've done more of these than any other of my series. I've done probably over 30 of these. And um, this one is about uh, 14 feet high. It's made from uh, pressure treated timbers that are uh, held together with steel boxes that I weld together. And um, 
in the past I've had other sentinel works there at Common Ground. This is the piece that I had intended to bring to uh, Common Ground this year, but you know, um, virtually is all you're going to see of it. And then uh, this is a piece that, um, again, in fitting with uh, with the nature of my class, this is a piece that's also uh, from the Sentinel series. But in this piece, I I have some found objects that I've attached to the piece. These are um, bowls, stainless steel bowls that I've welded together and and then colorized. And then this is a piece, another piece from the Sentinel series. These pieces um, are quite varied in size uh, and color. They're uh, usually bright colors. They're usually uh, complementary colors to maximize the amount of, of tension. This, this is a, the only one of the Sentinels that is kinetic. This, this top element uh, moves in the wind. And, um, you know, some drawings here that are also from that series. I won't go into those individually. And now I'm going to go to a, a medley of uh, PowerPoint that shows um, a, a variety of works that, um, first the Sentinels. This is one of the largest. I've done, I've done some of these uh, outside the country. This one uh, I did uh, for the cycle trail that goes between Bristol and Bath, England. Uh, it's 25 feet high. I've also done a couple other large ones in Scotland that are 25 feet high. This is a smaller 12-foot uh, piece that's in my yard. Another series that uh, I've worked on is a series called The American Landscape. And I interpret the American Landscape with two iconic symbols, the, the anvil and the hot dog. The anvil is a serious symbol. The hot dog is more of a frivolous symbol, uh, a comedic symbol even. One that, uh, it's, it's junk food that uh, if we eat too much of it, it'll kill us. And so I put these two symbols together because of their incredible contrast. This is another, uh, this is a 13 foot anvil with a four foot hot dog sitting on top of it. It's made again with the inside structure is steel, welded steel, and then everything else is uh, on the bottom is wood. The, the anvil itself is made out of fiberglass. The hot dog is made from high density foam. This is another from the um, American um, landscape series. Again, the hot dog in this case is very abstracted. This is a piece that uh, carrying further the anvil uh, series, and in this case, I have a, a modeled heart, which I um, a cast uh, from from a modeled a clay modeled heart. Then I I cast the thing in paper. The entire piece is made out of paper, and the heart, the paper on the heart is is that of uh, shredded. Shakespeare sonnets. And I've done some public works, some large public works. This is a 12 foot uh, Vels fish that I did for the market center in, in Bad Zwischenon, Germany. This is a, a piece that I did for a cable company. Uh, and this is um, a company that, that actually makes wire cable. And it's, it's, um, 37 feet high. If I'm standing next to it, my head is right here. This is another, um, this was a, from the Sentinel series, this was for a company called CV Color. It's a company that does uh, color processing. And so what's happening here is that you have the transition from wet uh, film photography to go through this aperture. So it's a, a transitional concept. This is a piece that I did for the city of Baltimore. It's 15 feet long and 10 feet high. It's 
it's welded bronze and it's about um, you know it was for a school that's um, kindergarten through second grade when I did it it's now a, a charter school called um, um, Wolf Street Academy but it was for children um, you know quite young and it's, it's all about uh, children and their pets going to school it's somewhat of a Dr. Seuss type thing this is a piece uh, that's uh, uh, 14 feet high no I'm sorry 22 feet high this was done in China this is in the uh, at the Hilton Hotel in Beijing China um, it's stainless steel and then uh, just to show that I'm, I'm I don't always take myself real seriously uh, for several years now I've been involved with the Baltimore kinetic sculpture raid this first piece was um, um, a, a fried egg uh, developed around two uh, bicycles two uh, single speed huffies coaster brake bikes and then this is me as Wallace and this was one of my students as Gromit and uh, it's called the English cook breakfast and then this is uh, this is the first piece uh, that my friend Jack Kendall and I did also for the kinetic race uh, this one uh, we used uh, for our flotation uh, we used uh, a Cadillac and we wore Elvis wigs we were called rock and roll huff and puff that particular year we were fortunate to win the, the coveted uh, mediocre award which sent us to California and this was uh, another year that I did the kinetic race here I was called Sentinel Man Guardian of the Art People and uh, other, other wacky kind of works this one I collaborated with my wife on um, it's all about couch potatoes as this is um, a, a potato piece made from the couch here is made from potatoes and the the magic carpet uh, sits off floor about uh, 12 inches so it's um, all biodegradable and um, you know not all sculpture necessarily has to be permanent so um, that's just a, a, a quick medley of some of the stuff I do um, I, I like to combine processes you know when I'm uh, when I'm doing work sometimes I do modeled work sometimes I do cast work then sometimes like in the gun pieces I take things that I've cast and I make multiples of them and then those go into the sculpture as as an assemblage so assemblage is not just uh, junk or found junk it can be things that you make yourself and then assemble so I don't know is, is that take care of my 10 minutes I guess I guess it does so uh, anyhow thank you very much um, um, look forward to talking to some of you later thank you, thank you Jim. we are moving through a variety of media tonight there are so many uh, contributing items that are used in sculpture from direct to indirect processes uh, basically uh, Sara Murphy practices additive rather than subtractive sculpture in both the classes that she's teaching. Uh, she's going to address body adornment. Uh, Sara was a student teacher with my very best friend. So we have known each other quite a while and I've seen her grow. It's, it's hard to get brighter in color than Sara. <laughs> Take it away, Sara. Okay. Thank you, Linda. Um, yes, I wanted to um, give a shout out to Patty uh, for the Funky Junk class that I've had the pleasure of teaching uh, for nine years now um, at Common Ground, and I really enjoy it. Um, just helping people to find a new way of putting things together um, and just finding, you know, what's your path uh, within that. So uh, for myself, I've been, you know, making the sterling silver and fine gemstone um, handcrafted jewelry from um, inspired by nature. And that's you know, kind of the background to it, but then very much um, out of necessity because they didn't quite make um, colorful enough stuff. Uh, so needed to make some more things to find the color 
repertoire, you know, that I would want to express and wear. And, um, and that began the journey of creating jewelry and, and selling it. And then, um, but then over time, like finding like stuff was more fun. And so recycled elements into it. And I really appreciate uh, the format at Common Ground and teaching funky junk jewelry there um, that just really getting into some weird and wacky things that could go into the jewelry making. And then for this year, I'm changing up a little bit by adding fiber as an exploring element. And so um, the slides that I'm going to share with you this evening are have more fiber content and just wanted to share, even though some of them are not jewelry things per se, I wanted to share that journey with you. So that first slide um, will show um, my love of fiber and my love of color. So this was, um, this is a hand crocheted, um, I don't know, it's kind of a, it's not a scarf, but it's kind of that concept of a scarf, but it's like big enough for your couch. Um, and it's 36 fibers are going in at once. And so really the experience of it, I really love process. And um, the experience of creating this was fascinating to me, seeing like all the lines coming into my hands at once. Um, had this powerful directional quality um, during the creating of this, um, but also not really knowing where I was headed with it, but just that I wanted to play and touch and experience. And so I love that about art making. Um, and so as I crocheted and then some of the yarns, you know, ran out and disappeared. And as I got to the end and then really saw kind of three color groupings there. And so um, had them go off into their own tails. And to trust that I don't know the ultimate end um, ending of this thing, but there it is, you know, just to follow it because it wanted to be made and I needed to make it. Um, so that was, that was a part of that. And um, in the next slide, there's a, a sculpture I did with a group of um, other art teachers. We had an experimental fibers class this spring. And so um, hearkening back to my college days, did some chicken wire sculpture underneath um, to create the form and then we really put out lots of different materials and, and what could we put together so I did the original form underneath but then shared and opened it up with a, a group of women that we were all collaborating and, and adding on to this piece and I believe that this piece is unfinished and I'm okay with you know showing it and sharing it with you as an unfinished piece it is um, living at my school and I will be inviting my um, students I'm an elementary school art teacher and I'll be inviting them to add on to the fun. Um, there were two pregnant women at the um, experimental fibers class that I taught. And um, so we also wound up having a belly within this creature, tree-like creature here um, with some sweet little treasures in there, which I love the parallel of that um, to the women that were working on it as well. And so in terms of motherhood, um, in the next slide, the, I got into making um, my mother, um, bless her heart, she has um, come through some her therapy um, for her, her um, breast cancer and I asked me to make a, an extra breast for her and then that got me along the path of crocheting um, boobs and I just kept going and I was like, wow, this is so comforting. You know, she loved the one I gave her and then I just found these fascinating in my hands um, this spring as I found that I needed something, I was compelled to have something constantly going in my hands to keep me anchored to the planet and understanding myself and what's going on in the world. Um, and so this is another in progress piece. I plan to make a, a big voluptuous pillow with a variety um, of colorful, um, soft, wonderful breasts all over it. Um, and so I look forward to snuggling up to that pillow. Um, next year <laughs> but i want to share that with you that this this journey of discovery um variety is one of my favorite design principles and um so i just i love seeing that you know in jewelry as well as now exploring it um in sculpture with this and on the next one i really love the dr seuss there we go <laughs> connected to jim um i love dr seuss's color schemes and the fun bright um mix of colors and so um you know, these were going to be, a, you know, maybe a part of something, but I really see them as a pair. And so I'm wondering if um, perhaps I will make something to wear um, that has these um, located in prime location um, on some objects. So I look forward to their future. But I wanted to share that um, as well this evening because this is my um, fresh exploration 
um, this year. And so transitioning to the jewelry piece, um, I had made a, a pair of earrings with, as I'm getting into sock monkeys the past couple years, and now teaching sock monkeys, which I'll speak about later, um, but I included um, you know, the, the beads and then wanted to explore how would I express fiber, um, within, within a jewelry piece, you know, how would that go? Could it go with the metal and have soft and hard, um, balancing together? And so, um, and then also again, another shout out to Patty. I love that she used safety pins in her work. And so, um, that inclusion here, uh, was, speaking to her, but as well, um, it helped me to capture the ribbon piece because uh, of course the, the yarn, it can tie on, um, but sneaking little gemstones and treasures as well as the um, paper beads. So combining that, uh, the assemblage of putting like all those different elements together and, and finding their balance together is a, a fun part of the journey. Um, and the, the last piece here, um, which let's go back to, um, I love these green beans. So it, it turns into, I want to make things with stuff that excites me. And so I found these plastic kid toy green beans and I desperately wanted that as a pendant. Right. And so then, um, and, but I knew it needed something else. And then a friend shows up with this ladybug in her hand and says, look what I found on the floor. And, um, the ladybug is a representation of my mother. So I, she jumped on the green beans and then use my wire skills to make a bail to add and glue to the back of this. So now this is a necklace. And so what a fun, um, fun thing there. So that was, that's the slides. Um, but I really, I guess the, the message that I would want to convey is play, play, have fun. Um, don't say no. Um, you know, when in doubt, look to the art elements and design principles as guides. Um, but then, you know, step out of the box a bit when you feel called to. So, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that you addressed the soft and the hard because sculpture does that, whether it's the reality of soft ingredients in the sculpture or hard ingredients in the, the sculpture or the illusion. Uh, because just like, like painting, sculpture can contain an illusion, something that tricks the mind into thinking that it's real when it's just a suggestion or an illusion. Cliff Santiago is our next speaker. Uh, Cliff and I were in grad school together at Towson as students of Jim and Sara was a student of Jim's also. So we've all known each other quite a while and it's really fun to explore the world of the third dimension together as colleagues because our work is so very different. Cliff is a very masterful worker of wood, and he's going to share some of his beautiful pieces with us tonight. Hello, and uh, welcome to York, Pennsylvania. And uh, this is my home, my studio, my gallery, and uh, all combined into one. Um, as Linda said, I. I over the years, I've gotten known for, for working in wood, and uh, it gets <coughs> continually increasing. People are always giving me wood, which <laughs> for the last five years, it, I, I have to actually turn wood down. Um, it's interesting listening to, uh, to Jim and um, Sarah talk about their work, because there's something that ties into my work as I go along as well. Um, I guess I could start with the largest piece I have here right now. When you go to found a found object, it doesn't get much more found than a piece of furniture. I discovered at a uh, at a uh, a used furniture shop. It's an antique piece that was in such bad shape that I knew that if somebody purchased it and tried to use it as furniture, it wasn't going to last. And to me, it was too beautiful to pass up. And it also fit, I'd been working for quite a few years on uh, the piece that actually is attached to that. Um, that I had always intended for it to hang on in front of a mirror and never quite got the right mirror for it. When I found that piece, um, it just all came together. So there is a found object used within a, um, a much larger piece and uh, 
there is, it's called reflections and you can't see from this angle, but on the opposite side is a female torso. And uh, it's, it's wonderful to have this at a show because people will look at the wood in the front and they're all like, ooh and ah, whatever it. But when they step to the side, you always get a, an oh moment because they can see what's happening and then they get the name. Um, on the other side, that's, that's about a five-year-old piece now. And truthfully, that particular piece hung in there and the process of making it lasted, oh golly. Uh, as I said, I, I couldn't find the right mirror for it. And the piece just kind of hung out there for quite a few years before I could finish it. Um, the one thing I can say about the, this, the lockdown, it's kept me in order to stay sane, I have worked in the studio more than I normally would. So for this period of time, I think I've done, I've done six pieces that uh, it's, and each of them is a little different and it kind of goes through, let me see if I can. Uh, okay, you can just make out, there's a piece here. This particular piece is the first piece I did, and this started uh, just about at the, the, the start of, of 2020. And um, the, the piece fascinated me with the, the, the texture of the wood, and I used the, the, uh, the sap wood to accentuate what I was trying to create here with the back of this piece. Um, you can, I don't know if you can make out, it's kind of hard to see, the front of this piece gets a little more, uh, there we go. The front of this piece is a little more ominous than most of my work and that kind of ties into uh, what's been happening in the, in the current world we live in. And then after that one, I, uh, let me set the camera up a bit here. This is a piece that came about from a conversation. One of my brothers and I have a totally opposite political views. And as we discuss things, we are each talking about, well, down the road, we're gonna discover what the real truth is. So this piece is called Two Sides. And if you can see one side, I, I left the, the roughness of the wood, that particular part had rot and lots of flaws in it. The other side is smooth. And if you, you notice that on this side, these things come through, there's a truth to those. This side, when you turn around, it's like something's happening here. It goes, goes in and back out. So it's the same conversation but with two totally different realities. That was what this piece was about. And I, when Jim's talking about his hot dog series, this one reminds me of something. This particular piece, suddenly almost looks like a hot dog. <laughs> So this one has a good bit of, this was just trying to ex explore that using the two types of wood and the fact that the, the maple wraps around the cherry piece, which again, um, I didn't even think of it at the time, but it goes, I'm kind of almost thinking about that hot dog in the bun. <laughs> And just to show that I am not totally only a woodworking sculptor, this piece, again, I'm talking about found objects. Um, I don't know if you can see these. Most people assume that they're metal just because they're that silver color. I use the, the female torso, which is a life cast. And then the, uh, these pieces come through. This piece is called um, Exhausted. And 
when I retired, this was something I did. I commuted up and down like, like uh, 50 miles each way on Route 83 every day. And it works quite well in the sense that I've had people tell me, oh, that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> and I said, exactly. This is 36 years of commuting. <laughs> <clears throat> and continuing with the current work, uh, here is a piece that the human form shows in my work quite a bit. Um, this particular piece, I certainly hope it's obvious that what this the figure in that one. That particular piece, um, one of the places that always inspire me are uh, boat museums. Um, I really started doing wood out of, uh, uh, actually uh, the Naval Museum in Madrid was a place that influenced me a great deal. Uh, seeing the, the models, the, the large scale models that were there of their boats. And sometimes they didn't, they don't, do necessarily the entire ship. They'll just have the hull, and it might be the hull inverted sitting there. And that was something that, that has influenced my piece. This particular one comes out of the, the process of uh, um, the boats that you see from the, the 30s, the wooden boats. The, the uh, I'll show you. The, the different woods to create the stripes running down it. All those boats had that. Sometimes it was just uh, the mahogany had inlay of, uh, of brass that would create the stripes, but in this case, I used the wood. And here's another smaller piece. While I was working on the one piece that I said was kind of a, a little more uh, uh, a rougher piece for me, it has, has a little harsher feeling to it. Uh, at the same time, I, I popped this one out just kind of to relieve the tension. It was kind of a little innocent little creature sort of thing here. And we can go with the, the most recent piece. This one, the spalled maple here just fascinated me. When I came across this piece of wood, I knew I had to do something different than the piece that's the two sides. This one really has three and they change. Each one has a totally different. And here again, you get almost that hands up little figure happening in there. And the base, I, I completed the piece not knowing that I needed this base. I started to think, oh, just put it on a base. But it somehow or other just called out for a little something a little different, and that's, that's where that one came from. Uh, uh, I, get, I should have started at the beginning saying that I, I have worked in, in pretty much all medium. Um, I don't have any of my steel sculptures. I do have a few ceramic pieces still here. Um, my house, you're, you're seeing a very small part of it right now. Uh, it pretty much looks the same all over. There's a lot of my artwork, but then there's a lot of artwork on the walls of other artists, that, that especially York artists. I have quite a few pieces. Um, right over my shoulder there is a fiber piece and another one there and a painting. And I have, I have quite a few uh, of the, artists from here in York. Um, thinking in terms of previous comments um, like from Jim about having a, a sense of humor, um, there have been times when I'll, I'll have some pieces like that. Right now, it just things haven't seemed like, <laughs> our world does not create that in my mind right now. And I have found though that when I get out in my studio and start working, I've, uh, I can turn off all of the, the 
information that comes flooding in from the TV, which is just very depressing right now. Um, uh, oh, I just see one other thing that I could point out. This piece is a piece I did for uh, plein air. And uh, just to show that, that uh, plein air is usually uh, painters go out and paint. And I went to a plein air, sat down and started carving. Um, it was, caused a lot of interest and just, just did that just to show that, uh, okay, the rest of the rest of the art world we can we can participate too so well i hope you enjoyed a, a real quick view of what i've been up to for i guess it's about three months now thank you thank you cliff thank you cliff um and some of your work amazingly reminds me of uh the braided piece Sara was talking about for the back of her couch because you have very enlarged fibers that interact. It's not the, the same as her work, of course, but that over and under weaving, the illusion of the wood weaving uh, reminds me a little of some of her fiber pieces. And she's going to take us to a brand new class uh, this year, uh, we're very excited to add it. We were, were hoping that members of a family might take it together to enjoy allowing younger people to participate in basically an adult class on sock monkey making. So Sara, tell us about your class and, and what you're doing. Okay, um, so yeah, we've um, added sock monkey and I happen to have the one I've been demonstrating and got it this far along, so it's waiting to see and hear yet, um, but turning a sock into a sculpture. Um, and it, it started from going to the Visionary Art Museum. So by all means, you know, there's places of art, of course we can't go in there at the moment, but, um, but definitely when you can, going and seeing art in museums can be such an inspiration. And the Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore um, as does their outreach programs and educational programs, but um, they had a sock monkey Saturday and I went to that in 2017 and absolutely fell in love. And this became a new medium um, for me to go back to sewing because I had done clothing before, but doing it in a sculptural sense is a really um, fun way to play. And so um, on my first slide, I have my very first sock monkey I made um, and his name is Deirdre. Um, and I made him at the, the Sock Monkey Saturday. Um, and they tell you to bring a pair of socks and scissors. And I did, but then there was this delightful shopping basket filled with socks people had donated and you could trade in. And that was the first two that I discovered, oh, my socks can mix and match. And so the first sock is the striped one um, with the polka dots. And then the second one is a different sock um, and it's a, from a different pair. Um, but and I liked how that went together. Um, so um, so this is Deirdre. And so on the next uh, slide, I get to um, her name is Sassy, and she um, was from just this past year. Um, so she's like a knee-high tube sock. It makes her be long-legged, but then her arms are not as long because they were made from an ankle sock. Um, and it's just neat to see how a sculpture will develop over time and right in your hands. It can take you, you know, in a different direction. Um, so I was, you know, thinking to include the ladybugs across her muzzle. Um, but then usually with a sock monkey, we would stuff the muzzle. But in this case, I just tucked it under and then thought, oh, maybe, you know, an eye and then that obnoxious blue eyeshadow that used to be all the rage. And then, um, I was making these um, little fiber, like fiber comfort, little uh, bundles of fiber for students that um, need that uh, soothing mechanism in class. And so I had made some and I just grabbed one and popped it on her head. And turns out she's got a wig now. So um, she feels really sassy. And so that's how she got her name. And she also has a, a funky junk element as her belt. Her belt is actually a hoop earring. 
um, that is put on, and her skirt is an, um, the heel of a sock that was cut from a student made a ninja sock monkey, and then I had that scrap, and so I used it together. So if certainly don't get rid of scraps and uh, hang on and reuse things. Um, and so in the next uh, sock monkey, uh, this one I, I was named Randall because um, our friend Randall um, did the, the flamingosaurus. So the, the body is flamingos, the arms have the dinosaurs. Um, and then as I was searching for what eyes to use, and these are um, ornaments from the visionary uh, gift shop. And so I, I put them on for the eyes. So there are mirrors that reflect. Um, and then uh, Randall is also wearing an ugly Christmas sweater. Um, so that's a, a little ankle sock um, that I cut the toe off of and then cut slits um, in the sides so that it could be a sweater for a monkey. Because doesn't a sock monkey need a sweater? Uh, and so and the next one was fun um, making an, his name I discovered is Cuckoo Kachoo. Um, and he always wanted to be a drummer, um, but he couldn't hold the drumsticks. And so he wound up with um, a tambourine and is a tambourine player. So he found his authentic um, musical instrument is the tambourine after all. Um, so this one was fun with so many eyes because you don't just need two eyes. If you're a monkey creature, uh, you can have more. Um, and uh, it's interesting as an, on the artist journey, right? So many of you listening here are artists as well. And you hear your inner voice speak about things, or you might hear this interaction between you and the sculpture. And so as I'm sewing, and you can see with this, there's eyelash yarn is what this, um, the yarn I stitched this with. And I, I, um, the tail of yarn that you usually like bury, and then you cut off the extra, um, came out right next to the face there, and I just wanted to keep it. So this has this long tail, and, and then every time I finished another part, I let the tail of yarn hang out by the mouth. So actually when I'm holding it in my hand, I wind up petting this tail of hair that's coming out next to the face, um, which, you know, is that even explainable? I don't know. It's what I wanted to do, and and so there it is. You know, that that's fine. And I, I enjoy the colors on this. It's a fresh, happy piece. And um and I love that he's a musician. Um, that makes me happy. Um, I never know what the monkeys will turn out <laughs> to be. So on the next one, I call Mommy's Favorite because it was a um, color combination that I really needed to see. So I find that, like I mentioned earlier, that um, you know, creating and touching your materials can be soothing um, and, and so many levels. And so... Um, this one, seeing the aqua of the arms with the complement of the orange um, of the yarn on it just does something. Seeing the sharp contrast of those complementary colors, like just, I don't know, something loosens up and feels more smooth inside when I see intense contrast. Um, so it just brings me balance in a way that I enjoy. And so... Um, and for this one, I, I really appreciate that. And again, here's a mismatch monkey that the, the body is a different color than the arms. Um, but you can see on his left ear um, that I included the banana. So I like to respond to the, to the socks a lot of times. Um, if there's something special on the print of the sock, um, you know, just spontaneously as you're working to realize, oh, this should be included, you know, as an intentional part um, of the monkey. And so on the, the last slide, um, I responded to the sock and uh, left the eye as the eye of the monkey. And um, there's another very well-placed eye here on the monkey. And so this one I call Visions of Love. Um, and uh, the hair piece for this one was um, an old, like it was a ponytail holder that I, I, I wore years ago. And I like how it, it jumped onto this um, monkey. It's actually rabbit. It's hard to see the ears, um, but it has rabbit ears. Um, and it reminds me of Andy Warhol a little bit with the way that the, the hair lays. So that's just been really fun. Um, and then a doll pillow behind it because props are fun with the monkeys. So, um, so that was the... Those are the monkeys. I think I've definitely made well over 100... Um, monkey sculptures in just a few short years here. Um, 
I tend, I'll make them and then donate for auction. So a fundraiser through my school based on holidays. Um, also, you know, as you're creating something and you're putting your intention in it with creating, but you're also putting your heart and your love goes into what you're making. And so um, very often I will make them and give them to someone that I need them to know how much I love them. So, um, you know, the, the monkeys, certainly people create and craft and um, sculpt and make things um, to sell and make things um, for display and for whatever different reasons, for exhibit, um, to impact others and change minds. Um, and I think that for me, I make things um, to show love. I want to communicate that. Also, um, for fun, I want to communicate, like, let's have fun with life, you know, whenever we can, because it, it can be heavy at times. And so find the things that make you smile, um, the things that bring you joy, and keep doing them and follow that, follow that call. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Sara. One of the things I'd like to discuss with all of you, because all of us have worked together and we're familiar with each other's work, is... Uh, the use of a repetitive motif in the work. Like with Sara, I see that eyelash yarn in her lengthy series of sock monkeys showing up again and again. With Jim in, in, in one of his uh, Americana series, you see the Saturday night special showing up in a wide variety of ways. Now his is a cast piece. He actually made a mold and cast that. And with, with Cliff, I see those tubular things that may be from his career in the Navy, um, maybe the, the shipbuilding museum in Madrid had those like functional parts, mechanical and human parts come together in his work. Would anybody like to speak about the, the repetitive use of particular forms or symbols in your work? Well, I've been enjoying oh. the, the eyelash um, yarn as like texture because color and texture are really so profound for me um, that and the, the, I think the challenge too of the material because the eyelash will tangle uh, very frequently. So um, that's like a personal challenge to overcome a bit. Um, but yeah, the color and texture really stand up uh, for me to be exciting and to have that response. Like I feel a, a physical response of joy when, when I, I see those things and feel them. So that that becomes repetitive within my work um, for the joy factor, yeah. You know, uh, currently the, the whole idea of multiples has become very, very popular among sculptors today. And so the whole idea of of doing a series of uh, castings to make multiples becomes really a valid way of working. You'll see multiples uh, art in lots of galleries today, very common. I've done very little uh, casting, so multiples don't usually show up with my work. Um, Thinking in terms of what, what um, Linda mentioned about what, that tubular shape that shows in my work, um, I'm not sure exactly why that shows up, but it's there all the time. And I have done a couple of pieces where it wasn't there until the end. Um, the piece right here with the, the, the female figure with her hands up on her head like that, that piece didn't have any of that on it. The, the side piece wasn't there. And just about finished the piece and said, something's still not there. And so that particular piece was added onto it. Um, basically, I cut off her foot and her foot turned into that tubular shape. And it, it, it took, the, instead of simply the emotion that was being portrayed by the piece of Mother Earth kind of going, oh my God, what are they doing to me? Um, to the, the tubular shapes, you have one coming out like in her face, blowing exhaust into her face and the other one going out the backside, just blowing out. So it, it, it became a way of getting the point across even stronger. Um, I had another piece that was a larger piece with a female torso in it again, and it protruded visually too much. So the piece I put on it 
that in that case, what it did was it it held that part within the fig the figure within the rest of the piece so that it, it worked together. So I'm not I, I don't know exactly why those show up all the time, but I certainly do seem to uh, uh, be drawn to that, and they it shows up a lot. Let's talk a little bit about uh, temporary or interior work versus exterior work and the life of a piece of work. Um, a lot of Jim's exterior pieces are wood and steel. And some of them were commissions out of the country. How do you prepare a piece to last outside with materials like that, Jim? Well, first of all, um, you know, I guess the, the dirty little secret about public sculpture is the word maintenance. And um, it's the thing that uh, frequently is not encountered or not discussed when public art is, is commissioned. And so every, every piece of public art should have with it some kind of a contract for, for the maintenance of it. Pe people don't mind maintaining a building, but they, they think a sculpture can just last forever without, without any, any work. Working uh, outdoors, uh, well, I, you know, the first time I learned about working outdoors is I made a piece that was about seven or eight feet high, and, and it was a piece that I couldn't put outdoors. And I realized, you know, if you're going to make it big, you better make it so that it'll go outside. And of course, then the minute you make it so it'll go outside, to think about maintenance. Steel will rust. It's just all there is to it. Uh, any painted surface has to be repainted periodically. So there is no, no such thing as maintenance free, you know? And then also when you do outdoor work, you have to think about, you know, like will, if kids climb on this, are they gonna be uh, putting splinters in their body or are they gonna be cutting themselves or, or are they gonna fall off of it and hurt themselves? So these, the, the, the considerations that go into making large scale outdoor public work are, are quite varied and many, you know, and they have to be considered. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I know the Baltimore Museum of Art uh, used to have the cast of Rodin's Thinker outside and basically pigeon poop was destroying the beautiful surface of that piece. So now rather than have it uh, as the greeting out in front of the Baltimore Museum of Art, they, they cleaned it up and brought it inside. The same with Albert Paley's gorgeous bronze gates that the Renwick commissioned. They were actually functional within the building itself, but uh, weather was destroying the surface of that metal. So now you go inside to see the bronze gates. Cliff, I'm imagining that most of your work is to be mounted inside. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um... I have done years ago, I've done some steel work, um, but um, like Jim said, it rusts away. It doesn't last. Um, it's like a, a piece that's 50 some years old. And uh, um, it was in a courtyard where the, the, actually the building, they enclosed the courtyard and turned it into, it was in, within a school. So um, that piece, I, by the time they got around to enclosing it, it was too far gone and they just scrapped it. Um, one of the things I was going to talk about this year, if, if we actually had classes at Common Ground, was, was exactly this issue. And um, one of the things with my work, it's um, time is such an essence of my work. Since I use different types of wood, they age in different manners and the colors change. So when I complete a piece, I'm thinking in terms of how long, you know, what it's going to look like 10 years from now, what it's going to look like 30 years from now because the, the, the wood oxidizes and changes color gradually over time. So that's something that, that actually you have to think about early on. Um, on a change off of my work for a second and go to, um, for an outdoor piece, I don't know if anybody got up to see, I know Jim did, um, um, Joyce Scott's piece up when she was up at uh, uh, Grounds for Sculpture. It was a huge outdoor piece, basically made out of mud with the intention that it would 
would deteriorate and the pieces on it would just slowly fall off and create this thing here. So she was taking that into account and creating a piece to do that, which I just, I really enjoyed that, that concept. And uh, so in, in fact, one of the, that it brings to mind uh, the other parts you said, people think that when they see ancient Greek art that somehow or other the stone artwork will last and even there it gets destroyed by by the weather and the pieces that we actually do have in museums are there because usually they were buried sometime and dug up they they were not out exposed to the weather other otherwise they would have been uh, quite severely degraded well there's so many issues to talk about uh, the surface whether the piece is meant to be touched uh, Jim mentioned some problems with with touching the surface of some sculpture, but we're running out of time. And I really appreciate your participation tonight. We have two more evenings of gallery talks coming up Wednesday. Please join us at 630 to discuss uh, upcycled work, fiber works oh, and wearable um, decorative pieces. And Thursday night, we have a panel of fiber workers. All kinds of techniques will be discussed because that was one of our programs that was seriously gutted this year by going online since most of you just don't have a big loom at home. And we had planned loom rentals and uh, we've had several successful fiber classes going and those instructors will be with us on Thursday looking forward perhaps in 2021 uh, to being together in, in person. Thanks for joining us tonight for our three-dimensional gallery talks. It's been very exciting for me because I'm a sculptor and I never get tired of talking about this stuff. There's so many areas that we, we didn't get to touch on in just this hour, but I appreciate the, the depth and breadth of the work of the artists included here, and I hope you've enjoyed the evening. I'm Linda Van Hart, Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. Enjoy the rest of your evening. The concert starts on the same channel at eight o'clock. And if you like this talk, and, and engage your friends with the login for our audience and they can view it on the Common Ground YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.